Turn with me, if you will, over to the book of Revelation. We're learning how not to become like the church at Laodicea. This is the fifth part of that second half. We looked three times at how bad Laodicea is. Tonight, we're learning more about how we can avoid becoming like Laodicea. We're in Revelation chapter 3. I'll start reading in verse 14. Revelation chapter 3. angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things set the Amen. Emmet, truth. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot, Cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched. And miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent! Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that the Lord Jesus gave that one little phrase, whom I love. Oh, Father, as many as I love, I chasten. Laodicea was believers wishy-washy, lukewarm believers, saved and on their way to heaven. They had their fire insurance policy. They had their escape ladder to get out of the second story window. But they did nothing for Christ. And he calls on them to repent. Father, as we study tonight what you have laid out in your word as to how to go about repenting, not merely saying we're sorry, 
but actually doing something about it. We pray that you will quicken our hearts and give us understanding and obedience so that we might once again have that first love, that zealous love. And how interesting to see a contrast between Ephesus and Laodicea. Ephesus had also lost their first love and it had resulted in a strict legalism. Laodicea had lost their first love. It resulted in putrid sloth. Different churches, but Jesus loved them both. And he gives the call to repent. Father, we pray that you will remove the sloth, the putrid, rotting sloth from our lives and give us the joy of our salvation as we grow in Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, and as I have just prayed, Laodicea was a church of true believers. Jesus is standing outside and knocking the door for fellowship, not for salvation. These are people who already knew Christ, loved Christ, but then let their love sort of wane away as they focused on the things of earth, temporal things that pass away. We've learned that a new believer's new life begins at the moment of salvation, the spiritual birth of John 3. We've learned that spiritual growth begins immediately upon spiritual birth. We've learned that spiritual growth is required. It's not an option for the obedient Christian. We studied many verses related to our personal responsibility. That is the human side of what God commands us to do related to spiritual growth. Last time, that brought us to the second half of our spiritual growth principles. Spiritual growth is accomplished by the Spirit of God as we yield to him and follow his direction. The first thing we looked at is what's our obligation. Second thing we're looking at now is what does the Holy Spirit do as we obey, as we yield and do what we know God wants us to do. Some of the verses related to God's side of responsibility, some of the passages we've studied thus far start in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. And when we are exercising Christian liberty, not libertinism, that's verse 17, the Holy Spirit of God begins to work in our hearts and we are changed into the same image, the image of Christ, from glory to glory, that is, it's a progression. Things get brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. As you walk the path of faith, as you yield to the Spirit of God, the path becomes clearer and clearer, and the darkness outside becomes darker and darker. We're changed into the same image, that is the image of Christ, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The second passage that we studied somewhat in depth was the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit, not the works of the flesh. You can't work this up. You can't hang plastic apples and plastic bananas and expect it to be the fruit that God appreciates. The Holy Spirit inside of you, as you yield to him, brings that growth from inside and it goes out into the branches. And Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me will bear fruit, much fruit, abiding fruit, John 15. Three levels of fruit bearing as you change from glory to glory to glory, you'll bear fruit. You'll bear much fruit. You'll bear abiding fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit will be manifest visibly in your life. You'll never become like Laodicea if you're actually bearing the fruit of the Spirit, not putting plastic imitations up, 
but actually bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Then we saw in verse 25 that that's contrasted with what we are responsible for, the fruit of the Spirit, and it gives the fruit, and then it says, verse 24, here's your responsibility. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. That's something you are responsible for. God the Holy Spirit will give you the power to do it, but you must crucify the flesh with its lusts, with its affections, the things that it loves. Just say no to the flesh. Just say no. Nail it up. It'll scream and yell. It'll wiggle and try to get off the cross. But just say no. It will harangue you and harass you and bug you all your life because you're not going to be free from the flesh till you get to glory, but you crucify it. That's a long, painful death. It doesn't kill the flesh. It hangs it up and out of the way. And the conclusion is verse 25. Yielding to the Spirit produces the spiritual walk empowered by the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, that is your position in Christ. So we get the positional and the practical. If we live in the Spirit, and we do, then what is the result we should expect? Let us also walk in the Spirit. What God does, He puts you in Christ and you live in the Spirit. What you do is you walk in the Spirit. That means daily practical activity, control of your life, direction for your life, ultimate goal and destination in your life, you walk in the Spirit. Then we looked at Ephesians chapter 3. The Spirit strengthens the inner man. The Spirit roots us and grounds us in love. The Spirit gives us understanding of the love of Christ, which, as he points out in that passage, is absolutely infinite. The Holy Spirit fills you. The Holy Spirit works in you above all that you could ever ask or think. And we spent some time on that, uh, describing each of those different works of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer last week. So we'll not go over that again, but I'll read it for you. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. You cannot get spiritual strength by working it up in the flesh. You have to be strengthened in the inner man by his spirit. That's God's work. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And to know the love of Christ. Ah, oh, we're going to know the love of Christ. But, uh, which passeth knowledge? You can never get to the end of it. You can keep learning and learning and learning and growing. And, wow, the love of Christ goes even farther than that. Which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, Oh, the Holy Spirit fills you. And by the way, that's the only work of the Spirit that you are commanded to obtain. All the rest the Holy Spirit does automatically. But you are commanded, be filled with the Spirit. We talked about filling. We talked about different sized vessels. We talked about expanding vessels. But no matter how big you get, you're always responsible to be full at the top. But you'll never know the infinite breadth of the Spirit of God. Nonetheless, you should be growing. You should be expanding. And the filling of the Holy Spirit should permeate every little crevice and crack in every part of your life. Your thoughts, your words, your actions, your attitudes, your motives. Five areas that the Holy Spirit wants to completely fill you. As a new believer, you're a small vessel. But as you grow in Christ, the vessel becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the filling of the Spirit becomes greater and greater so that you have a greater impact on the world around you. Be filled now. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. That's God working. This is God's side of it. According to the power that worketh in us. And he does it in you. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. 
And then the Holy Spirit works in you to control your will. And controlling your will, he then controls your actions for his good pleasure as you yield to him. That's Philippians 2.13. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So we've seen the human side. We've seen the divine side that is necessary to be joined together to produce spiritual growth that's beneficial both to you and to the entire body of Christ and which will keep you from ever becoming like the church at Laodicea. And so last week, we began the next part. Obviously, only God can do the things we just talked about, but there has to be a connection between the human side, that's responsibility, the side that engages our regenerated will, and the divine side, which is the sovereignty of God. So what does the Bible say about the connection of the two sides so that power flows through the circuit? When you flip a switch, you're joining two things together that cause the power to flow and the light bulb to come on. So what are the things that God uses to flip the switch and join those two sides so that the lights come on? How does God tell us to activate our side of the equation? The switch that God uses to bring about spiritual growth. And we noted last week, we began with the first one. I haven't finished it yet. But we began with the first one that the Holy Spirit uses. In other words, the means of growth that the Spirit has commanded us to be involved in. Principle number one. The first switch God uses to activate spiritual growth in our lives is continual reading of the Bible and continual obedience to it as we understand it. As illumination takes place, as you're reading, and suddenly you say, whoa, I never saw that before. I know you've had some of those, if you're studying the Bible, if you're not just mindlessly looking through the words, but if you're actually studying the Bible, you will have what I call wow moments. <laughs> Where you say, oh, I've read that passage a hundred times. I never saw this before. I can remember coming home from working at the radio station, a uh, big classical station in Dallas, Texas. That's the way I paid my way through seminary. Every night I'd work till 2 o'clock in the morning, then ride my bicycle back a couple of miles uh, through some very bad neighborhoods to get back to the seminary and go to sleep for four or five hours and get up and get ready for class. But when I got home, I'd always have some Bible reading. Quiet time with the Lord. One evening I came back, and I was reading John 14, 15, and 16, which is the upper room discourse. I'd read it hundreds of times before. I know the technical parts of it. But I was reading it, and suddenly God the Holy Spirit opened my eyes. Jesus is talking about love. And then he's talking about joy. And he's talking about peace. And I realize he's promising in these three chapters the coming of the Holy Spirit. And what's he doing? He's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And I got so excited, and I began to dig into that passage, and I found them. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. It's in the upper room discourse! And I've never seen it, and Paul gives it to us in Galatians 5, and Paul wasn't there that night. He got it by special revelation. I was so excited, I didn't go to sleep that night. Have you ever had a moment of excitement when you're studying the Scripture and God opens your eyes to it? And suddenly you realize the infinite depth of the Word of God. And it fills you with joy. And it makes you want to obey. And it makes you want to learn more. And it wants you to make, makes you want to love Christ more because he loved you. Oh, I hope you've been through that. I go through that periodically. Almost every time I prepare for a message, I go through some of it. But sometimes I get a really big one like that. And boy, I tell you, you think, well, that wasn't such a big thing, and now you told us, and so we'll be able to find it. It's not a big deal. It's when God opens your eyes to it. I'm not going to tell you all the insights that God has given me at different occasions, because that'll spoil it for you. You'll hear some of them as I preach. But it's your personal understanding where the Spirit of God opens your heart. That's when it makes a difference and moves you into spiritual growth 
and into obedience of the Word of God. The study of the Bible and then obedience as God opens your heart. We look at Matthew 4, 4. He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's not just come alive, it's living day by day by day. That's the way you live your life. What does the Bible say about it? Do you apply it? Do you know how to apply it? Has the Holy Spirit given you understanding so that you can apply it to this situation that you're going to face tomorrow? Philippians 2.12 Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, 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 not as in my presence only, not just when I'm watching you, but now much more in my absence, you obey the word of God even when I'm not around to harass you. All of you all have had somebody in your life who's harassed you. Might have been a grandparent, might have been a parent, might have been a kid, might have been a pastor, <laughs> might have been a Christian friend, might have been a husband, might have been a wife. People who harass us. Yeah, our lives do have a few of those, don't they? Paul says, what makes me so excited is I wasn't there to harass you and you still obeyed. Wow. That means something clicked inside. That means God is working in you. In fact, it's showing an outworking of something that's going on. He talks about the outworking of your salvation with fear and trembling. We read James 1, 21 through 25. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. That means like really super duper wickedness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word. Ah, we're back to the word. It does the first thing, it saves your souls, but it does something else. The very next verse, but be ye doers and not hearers, only deceiving your own selves. If you listen to me preach, and if I preach the truth, and God convicts your heart, and you know it's the truth. Now some have hard hearts and they don't want to hear the truth, but if I preach the truth, and you have heard it, whether you like it or not, you are accountable before God for obeying the truth. That's why lots of churches don't like preachers that preach the truth. They'd rather have somebody like Aaron who will make them a little golden calf and they can wiggle their bodies in strobe lights on the stage. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. That means somebody preached it to them. Because if you don't do it when you hear it, you're deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty. Remember we've talked about Christian liberty genuine liberty whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty remember we were talking about where the spirit of the lord there is liberty we were talking about beholding as in a, in a glass the glory of the lord and being changed from glory to glory this is all tied together folks and continueth therein you don't turn away. You keep looking into that mirror. You're being changed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, but you got to look in the mirror. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now that brings us to the next part of our study tonight, this new material, but it's continuing with that first switch the switch that ties the divine sovereignty with the human responsibility and causes the power to flow and the lights to turn on. Bible reading, continual obedience, whenever God gives you new understanding of what you are reading. Now, one of the things that I've noticed, both in Scripture, which is the whole reason for the prophets, uh, this is a foundational principle of all the Old Testament prophets, all the New Testament prophets, all the proclamations and preachings that you see in the book of Acts, God often sends someone who is skilled in the word to teach you if you're really serious about understanding. 
Now, God sends his prophets, too, to people whom he has already said are going to have faces like flint, whom he has already told the prophet, they're not going to listen to you, but you go and preach anyway. But God uses people. Remember that because he uses you, too. God gives the spiritual gifts. God expects every one of us to use the gifts that he has entrusted to us. Let me ask a question. Do you know which gifts God has given to you? If you're saved, you have spiritual gifts. Not just one. You've got multiple spiritual gifts because some of them are every believer gifts like the gift of faith, like the gift of giving. Those are every believer gifts. Now, you know at least two of your gifts. Do you know the rest of them? God gives every believer specific individual gifts that he doesn't give to everybody else because the body of Christ has to be able to work together. And in every body of believers, all of the gifts are present so that the body can build itself up and edify itself in love. It's one of the key principles of the book of Ephesians. How every part supplies something. Paul talks about that also over in 1 Corinthians. How every member of the body is essential for every other member of the body, and when one member doesn't function right, it's like having a broken arm or a broken foot or having some kind of an internal disease like liver cancer or something. If you're not, using your gift and the whole body suffers God sends someone who is skilled in the word to teach believers if they're really serious about understanding you say well you know but what about if uh, some missionary comes through in the middle of Africa someplace and he leads somebody to Christ and that guy has got just a, a scrap of the Bible in his own language, but he sits there and he studies it and reads it and says, did you know God will send somebody to him? If he's serious about understanding the word of God, you say, okay, give me an illustration. All right, how about the Ethiopian eunuch? The Ethiopian eunuch was already reading and studying the Bible, but he had no idea what it meant. But that didn't stop him from reading it and studying it and wondering about it and hoping he could somehow understand it that the Spirit of God would somehow give him life. Now, he was already doing what he was supposed to be doing before God gave him light. You see, he was a Gentile convert to Judaism. And one of the requirements for Judaism was that all the adult males, three times a year, had to go up to Jerusalem for the feast. Now, if he'd said, now look, I'm really busy. I'm the treasurer for an entire country. I got incredible responsibilities. You know, uh, maybe next year I'll go up to the feasts. You know, I, I, I'm busy. I, I don't think I have time to read the prophet Isaiah. I, I think instead, I better make sure the balances are correct here. Otherwise, Queen Candace will, you know, she might have my head. He would not have come to Christ. He would not have understood the prophet Isaiah. He was busy doing as much as he knew how to do. He knew two things. He knew he had to go to Jerusalem for the feast. And that meant he had to come back home. And he knew he had to study his Bible and be serious about studying it and wanting to understand it. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, does God send people who are skilled in the word, who know the truth, to those who really, really want to know the truth? The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now that doesn't sound like a very cheerful place to go. I mean, he's been participating in a great big revival. You want me to go into the desert? But Philip was obedient. Well, if Philip had said, I'd rather be where the action is. I mean, that Lord, there's nothing down in the desert. 
I know, I've been there. Me, I've been there. There is nothing down there. Philip could have said that. Even less was down there back in those days than there is now. But he obeyed. If you learn to obey when you understand the will of the Lord, you suddenly get drawn into incredible ministry and blessings. That's what we're talking about here. What's the switch that God uses to make us, with his sovereignty, empowered by his sovereignty and his spirit, but as we obey, to have effective service for Christ? Philip understood it. Ethiopian Ute understood it. They did what they knew as far as they knew it. God didn't tell him in advance, there is an Ethiopian eunuch down there who is going to trust me when you get to him. God just said, start walking. Head south. And God made the intersection in their lives. One guy walking down from Samaria, another guy riding in a chariot from Jerusalem, and they ran into each other on the same road at a precise moment in time? Do you understand God's timing? That's part of the love of God. It's unfathomable. And the more you see of it, how God brings precise points in the moments of our lives where I may intersect with a specific opportunity that God has given to us, and either we will obey or we'll be like Laodicea. He arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for the worship. He was doing as much as he knew how to do. And now he's on his way home. He's obeying the law. It's all he knew. He didn't know that Christ had come and fulfilled the law. That Christ was Pesach, the Passover lamb. But he really wanted to know more. And he wasn't reading somewhere out of, you know, Maccabees or something like that. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. In fact, he was reading a specific part of the prophet Isaiah when Philip ran up alongside the chariot and heard him reading. Was that an accident? Or do we find two men both doing what God told them to do and because of their obedience to the word of God, God brings an intersection into their life that not only transforms a man but carries the gospel to Ethiopia, a man of authority and power who can make a difference. Dear people, we need to learn to love the Bible and desire it and want to know it so that, get the words, so that we can obey it. Too many of us don't want to really learn what the Bible says because we know that will make it incumbent upon us to be obedient. And we'd really rather not. was returning and sitting in his chariot read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. The man's reading it out loud. Do you ever read the scripture out loud? Do you ever try to read it with expression? When I read the scripture to you, I don't read it like this. 
but I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace they brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd. Do I ever read like that to you? Do I? No. I try to put my whole soul into it. If something makes the word of God dull, I want to be smacked in the head. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Read it aloud to yourself. Try to read it with expression so that you understand. Make pauses, verbal pauses, so that you get the point of the passage. The eunuch was reading it out loud. He didn't care about what everybody else thought. He wouldn't try to witness anybody because he had no idea what it meant. But he's reading it out loud. And Philip heard him. And Philip said, Understandest thou what thou readest? The Ethiopian eunuch may have just been sort of reading it along and with puzzled questions in his voice. And so Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I? Except some man should guide me. He desired to understand because he desired to obey. How do we know he desired to obey? Because he was already obeying all the light that he had. He had already gone to Jerusalem to worship. He was already on his way home and studying the Bible. What can I do next? What can I do next? When you study the Bible, do you do that? What do I do next? Lord, I'm obeying. I think I'm obeying everything that I know I'm supposed to be doing. What do I do next? Please show me in your word. Let, let me understand this passage here. If you have that passion, you will never become like the church at Laodicea. How can I except some man should guide me? God always sends someone to the man who wants to understand more and who's obeying all the light he's got. He always does it. Because that's a man who wants to grow. And God wants to perfect in us the image of Christ as he transforms us by the Spirit of the Lord from glory to glory. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. You know, it's interesting. God had him reading that passage. He didn't have him reading over in the book of Daniel, one of the prophecies about the coming kingdoms that are going to be, you know, ravaging through the land of Israel or something. That man wasn't ready for that yet because he needed to know Jesus. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? He didn't know. God sends someone skilled in the word to teach you when you have this desire. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? It's clicking, click, 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 click. He's going, go, 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 Bong, 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 bong. What do I do next? 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 And, you know, amazingly, in the middle of that journey, in the desert, they suddenly came to a place where there was water. And he's beginning to click with the different things Philip has told him about Jesus and probably a little bit of the early church and what's been going on. And, and, and the eunuch says, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? 
He was a man who wanted to obey. Every time a light bulb came on and he saw something that God wanted him to do, he did it. Most of us want to keep our eyes closed even when the light bulbs come on. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, don't give me any wishy-washy belief. Don't give me a half-baked belief. Don't give me a well-I-think-so belief. If thou believest with all thine heart. Oh, what do I got to believe? And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now we don't know how long Philip expounded Jesus to him. It might have been an hour, might have been two hours, we don't know. But at the end of that discussion of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, at the end of that discussion, the man knew who Jesus was, and he said, that's my next step. He'd seen the truth of the Old Testament. He converted to Judaism. He'd obeyed as much as he knew how to do. He still studied because he knew there must be more. And God sent someone to him, skilled in the word, so that he might take the next step. Dear people, this is not to pat myself on the back, but God put me here for you. I spend time studying the word. I spend time looking for applications for this church. Sometimes I say some hard things because there are some areas in the church that need a lot of work. But God put me here for you. Are you going to be like the Ethiopian eunuch? Philip was no big deal, just another man, just like I'm just another man. But God sent you a trained man to help you with the next step of spiritual growth. Will you do it? As you understand things from Scripture, will you obey them? The whole point of illumination is not just so that you can have a fat head. The whole point of illumination, that is where the Spirit of God gives you understanding, the whole point is obedience. Because as you obey, you grow. And as you grow, you do not become stagnant and you do not become like Laodicea. And he commanded the chariot to stand still and they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. That was as far as God was going to let Philip take the eunuch. God brings people into your life to bring you to a point of growth. And if it happens, God may take the man away. Because now you've got some footing and he wants you to start doing it yourself. Remember that. The eunuch saw him no more. But he didn't say, why did God do that? Now come on, Lord. That guy was teaching me stuff, and we only got through one chapter of the Old Testament. I mean, don't you want him to stick around and teach me some more stuff? Was the eunuch bent out of shape? What does it say the eunuch was like? It says, and he went on his way rejoicing. He said, boy, I got a good start, and I'm going to keep pursuing it. I pursued what I, what I knew, and I, I, I kept those Jewish laws, and... But I wanted to know more, and so I was reading Isaiah the prophet, and God dropped this guy out of the sky at me. Well, not really. Philip had to walk. Philip had to obey, too. 
and he explained it in a way I understood it. Wow. That's one of those wow moments where God gives you insight that tickles you pink and gets you out of your little booties and dancing barefoot. Has God ever done that with you because you desired to grow? It's there. It's available. And it's exciting when it happens. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. As soon as the eunuch understood, he believed. He was baptized, but he was already doing what he knew he was supposed to do. You cannot expect God to give you light in a brain vacuum. You're required to have the content package in your brain that you have put there by studying the Bible. The Ethiopian eunuch was also doing what he was required to do as a Jewish convert. You know, I already said that, going up to the feasts. This was no easy feat. He was riding in an open chariot across the desert, not in a comfortable, air-conditioned limo sipping cherry limeade. From Ethiopia, this was a miserable journey of more than a week each way at top speed. But he was sitting there in the sun. He was probably sweating profusely. And what was he doing? Was he lying down where a bunch of other guys just fanned him and saying, man, I'll be glad when we get home and I can get a bath. What was he doing? He was studying the Bible. It didn't matter how uncomfortable he was. He was serious about knowing the will of God. He was serious about doing the will of God. And God answered his thirst for obedient knowledge. God does not give intellectual titillation just to satisfy our idle curiosity. Bible study is a switch used by the Holy Spirit, and it has a purpose. The purpose is to activate spiritual growth in our lives. If you're not activating spiritual growth when you make Bible study noises, something's wrong. Notice how Peter writes about this first switch also, the switch that God uses to activate spiritual growth in our lives. 1 Peter 1.22. Oh, every one of the apostles talk about this. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. You got to know the truth. You got to obey the truth. And you cannot obey the truth in the flesh. Remember, we're talking about the work of God in the life and the obedience of the believer as he understands. Obeying the Spirit uh, obeying the truth through the Spirit, ah, and it will result in something. Unto unfeigned, that is, not fake. You know, you've heard about fake news? Well, there's such things as fake love. Unfeigned means it's not fake. Not fake love of the brethren. That's what the word purifying your souls does. As the Spirit of God takes it and works, and you obey it. It produces unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. You know, I often sense sort of a surface kind of love between the brethren. It says love one another with a pure heart. It's not a love that is erotic. Love one another with a pure heart. But it's not just sort of at arm's distance. It says, love one another with a pure heart, fervently. What was the problem with Laodicea? You're neither hot nor cold. Fervent means with heat. If you have a fervent love for the brethren, you know what else is going to be a fervent love? Because you have a pure heart that's being moved by the Spirit of God, you're going to have a fervent love for Christ. You will not be cold. You will be hot. Love one another with a pure heart fervently. Not erotic love, not platonic love, but a godly love. And in all purity. No sensuality involved in all purity, where you love them enough to die for them. 
We talked about that this morning and we saw how Moses was willing to die if God would spare the lives of all those Jews. We asked, would you be willing to die if it meant that every one of the Jews in the Holocaust, six million Jews, would not only be spared Hitler, but would be saved? Would you do it? I said, I'm not sure I would. But Paul said he would. Paul said he was willing to give up his own salvation for the salvation of his brethren, the Jews. Paul had the same spirit that Moses had. Loving one another with a pure heart, with a passionate heat. The kind of love that Christ says they didn't have at Laodicea. Spiritual growth here includes two things. One, soul purification by obeying the Bible. You want soul purification? Then when you understand something, you obey it. That produces soul purification. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. So spiritual growth first includes soul purification by obeying the Bible. That's empowered by the Spirit. And two, developing love for other Christians. Where you see the fruit of this growth is the application. Love one another with a pure heart fervently. Then he goes on in verses 23 through 25. Being born again. So here's where it starts. That's where spiritual growth starts. Not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. All flesh is grass. All the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower that falleth away, thereof falleth away. What lasts? Which is why you always want to be flipping this switch. What is always a valid power source, it does not go out like the power grid in Puerto Rico. It does not go out like the power grids down there in North Carolina after the most recent hurricane. What is always there? The word of the Lord endureth forever. That's where he started in obeying the truth, obeying the word of the Lord. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Notice how John writes about this first switch. We're almost done here. Notice how John writes about the first switch that God uses to activate spiritual growth in our lives. The first switch is absolutely essential for overcoming the devil. You've got to have this first switch, which is studying the Bible with the intent of obeying it as soon as you understand it. That's switch number one. Studying the Bible with the intent of obeying it as soon as you understand it. That switch is absolutely essential for overcoming the devil because that way he won't be able to deceive you because you know the truth. 1 John 2.14 I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because you are strong. Now listen to the next phrase. And the word of God abideth in you. Here's the switch. Lights go on. You're not going to get tricked. You can see what's coming down the road. You're not going to believe echoes. You're not going to believe hallucinations. The word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. That first switch of having the word of God abiding in you, it's pulsating. The power is flowing through you. You're understanding it. You're obeying it. The devil says, why don't you try this? You say, no, that's not what the Bible says. The devil says, well, but you ought to do this. You say, no, that's contrary to what the Bible says. The devil says, well, why don't you try this? It'll be fun. You say, no, God pro prohibits that. Because you know the word of God. Switching on that switch of, one, of desiring to obey the Bible and pursuing obedience through the study of the Bible helps you overcome the devil. He won't be able to deceive you because you know the truth. That brings us to the second switch, and we'll start that next week, but that is unceasing prayer. And not just for ourselves, but for other Christians. 
we have to move away from self-focus. If your prayer request and if your prayer life always focuses around, number one, yourself, that switch won't work. And we'll talk why next week, the Lord willing. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Make us like the Ethiopian eunuch, obeying everything that we know we ought to be obeying, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it takes time, even if there seems to be delay. Make us obedient to everything that we know and understand. And then give us an earnest, passionate desire to know more so that we can grow, so that we can obey more. As we focus on the scripture day by day, give us the prayer, Lord, help me to understand this so that I can obey, so that I can be changed from glory into glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, so that I can be empowered in my inner man and strengthened for the spiritual warfare to which you have called me so that I can overcome the enemies, the world, the flesh, the devil, the demonic forces, so that I can reflect Jesus more perfectly to those who are around me, so that I will have a fervent love for the brethren and a fervent love for Jesus Christ, so that I will never become like Laodicea, thinking I've got it all. Let me realize that the love of Christ passes all knowledge I can never stop growing. I can always press forward for the goal, for the prize of God in Christ Jesus. I can always be reaching forth to that which is ahead. And I can always be getting victory. And I can be leading others too. Father, teach us, we pray, to desire to know so that we might obey. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 540. My hope is in the Lord. Let's sing.